When you don't know how to pray, pray anyway. Ignorance is no excuse. When you don't feel like praying, pray anyway. Depression is no excuse. When dullness sits on you like a vulture and you can't muster enough energy to check your phone messages, much less to pray, pray anyway. Boredom is no excuse. When you see no need to pray and no reason to intercede for those about you, recognize this as a sign of impending danger and pray anyway. Blindness is no excuse. When you don't understand what the big deal is about prayer and you think it's overrated because it never did you much good, pray anyway. Immaturity is no excuse. When you're too tired to remember your own name and you know God will understand if you don't pray, pray anyway. Fatigue is no excuse. When you're embarrassed to be back before God confessing the same sins and admitting the same failures, come on and pray anyway. Shame is no excuse. When you've been unfaithful and you know it and you feel like the burden of guilt that makes you want to run and hide under the porch is there pray anyway. Sin is no excuse. When the nagging voice of the enemy keeps telling you there is no God, and even if there were, he would never have anything to do with a nothing like you, pray anyway. Unbelief is no excuse. We can bless ourselves immeasurably by rescuing our prayer life from bondage to our emotions and circumstances. There is no time and there are no circumstances in which prayer is not necessary, not helpful, and not the right thing to do. Let us pray, and let us pray anyways. Those words that I've just read are from the introduction to the book by Dr. Joe McKeever, Pray Anyways. Dr. Joe McKeever, you would do yourself well to get this little book, and you can find out information about it from joemckeever.com joemckeever.com and let me read those concluding sentences to you again after these introductory words we can bless ourselves immeasurably by rescuing our prayer life from bondage to our emotions and circumstances has your prayer life been taken bondage by emotions and circumstances well this little booklet will help you and I encourage you to get it. Now, I'm using it as an introduction to my message on this Wednesday night for our midweek Bible study on Let Us Pray, or Let's Pray. And as Dr. Joe has encouraged us, let's pray anyway. Whatever the circumstance or situation you may find yourself in for not wanting to pray or not thinking that you can pray, let us pray. And I want you to take your copy of God's Word and turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to begin reading in verse 5. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Now, there's a parallel uh, passage of Scripture to what I'm about to read found in Luke chapter 11. And in chapter 11, beginning with verse 1, the disciples are with the Lord Jesus Christ, and they make a petition of the Lord. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, if the disciples needed some teaching on prayer, after being with the master of prayer for the time that they were, then I think you and I could heed what the Lord Jesus Christ shares with them as he expands on his answer on that question, Lord, teach us to pray, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6 and verse 5. In Matthew chapter 6, we get a little more background to the question that the or to the petition that the disciples made, and Lord, teach us to pray. So you have your Bible? If you don't, I want you to get it right now. Don't study with me without having a copy of God's Word. Would you put me on pause? Now you've turned to it, right? We're all in Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 5. You read along in your copy of God's Word as I read from mine. And when thou prayest, thou shall not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now, if you have a red letter edition of the Bible, 
you'll notice that these words are in red. And these are the words of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ speaking to his disciples concerning prayer. And as he speaks to his disciples then, he speaks to his disciples today. We who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ need to follow him in every area of our lives, including, uh, including the uh, uh, prayer. And we need to follow him concerning prayer. And he's got some rich uh, instruction for us because they come from the one who is our leader, who is our master, who is our Savior, the Lord Jesus. So we continue reading in verse 6. Now he's just told us a negative. He said, don't you be praying like those who like to pray to be seen of men. And so he says, these are hypocrites. If you're just praying to be seen of men or heard of men, uh, Jesus equates you with the hypocrites. Now he says, this is how I want you to pray. He says, but you, when you are praying, enter into your closet, and when you have shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And so we have two contrasts here. Those who pray out in the streets to simply be heard and seen of men. Uh, they have their reward. And Jesus says that's all they're getting, the adulation and the applause of men. And that's not very much because men can be fickle. And uh, they really won't get the answer to their prayer if they really were praying for something. So don't pray to be seen. Now, it's not speaking against public prayer. There is a place for public prayer. Jesus prayed publicly. But he's saying don't pray publicly just for the applause and the recognition of men. He says, but when you do pray, and uh, and uh, don't miss what Jesus just kind of uh, takes it for granted. Now, he doesn't take anything for granted because he knows the truth uh, when we're sincere and insincere. But he's saying that when you do pray, not if you do pray. And so he's indicating that we should be praying. And he says, go to your closet. That is to a secret place. That's what he says. The Lord, the Father who sees in secret and hears in secret what you are saying to him and asking and petitioning to him, he'll reward thee openly. Now, what's so important about, or what's so significant about going to the Lord in prayer in secret? Because sometimes when we do pray in public, we are praying to let people know that we are praying people. And we're more apt to pray in public when we're called upon because we don't want to disappoint those around us. But when we pray in secret, nobody's there to hear us pray except the Lord. And we won't do that in secret unless we really believe that the Lord is there. So it's an indicator of our faith when we pray in secret. You don't have to let anybody know what you're praying other than of the Father in heaven. And people can tell. Uh, you don't have to do it in public. They can tell uh, how your private life is by the way it's reflected in your public life. Generally, they can. Now, so we go to the Lord in secret because we know that he's there and we have the faith that he's there. We don't need to broadcast it to the public in order that to uh, sometimes we might have an ulterior motive in our prayer. Sometimes we might pray for a need in public, hoping that somebody else will hear what our need is. And rather than hoping that God will hear what our need is, we're hoping that somebody else might hear what our need is, and they will come through for us on our behalf. Sometimes we pray in public uh, to preach in public. And we pastors are uh, very... Uh, uh, guilty of that. We don't really pray. We're adding a little more on to our sermons, if you will. And we might be ad uh, admonishing somebody when we should just be having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the Lord. Now, it is good sometimes to encourage people through our prayers. And yet, what we're trying to say, what I'm trying to say is that we get in secret with the Lord and it's just you and me on him, uh, just you and him together and that's about as honest a conversation as you can have if you really believe he's there and if you really believe he's there you can pray in secret knowing that he hears your prayers knowing that he can answer your prayers and knowing that uh, 
he can answer them openly. You don't have to uh, pretend in front of somebody else and praying in public that you believe in God. You can pray to him in secret and he hears you. So he says, don't be like the hypocrites who pray in the public streets to be heard of men or in the in the public square to be heard of men. But you go to your private place, a closet. And when God the Father hears in secret, he'll reward thee openly. Now you keep praying. But when you are praying, and ver- or keep reading with me, and ver- go ahead and keep praying if you've been praying too. But verse 7 says, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. <laughs> Now, it doesn't mean to pour not to pour out your heart over and over again if that's what's on your heart, but you don't have to keep telling God, did you hear me, Lord? Did you hear me? Not like some husbands and wives. Did you hear what I said? Did you hear what I said? Or some parents to their children. Did you hear what I said? Did you hear what I said? God hears you the first time, and you don't have to be vain about your uh, praying, that is, repetitious, where it becomes a vain thing. Uh, he hears you the first time. If you're sincere and you pray, you can pray, and you can bring it to him again. That's not what it's talking about. It's just saying over and over again, trying to work up, you know, an audience with God. You don't have to. If you're his child, he hears you. Now, okay, let's go on to verse 8. But uh, be not, uh, excuse me, verse 8, Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. I got a little ahead of myself. God knows what you're uh, praying and God knows even before you pray it and so you're just uh, affirming and uh, giving through that uh, prayer that audible prayer to the Lord or even in the prayer in your heart God I know that you hear me I know that you already heard me I know that you already know what I'm about to tell you and so I'm coming to you and I don't have to keep coming to you and come coming to you and pulling on your shirt tail and get your attention you hear me the first time and I have the confidence and I have the faith uh, that you hear me. And I'm going to trust in you and I'm going to wait on you. And so he says, don't be like that. Now he's told us how not to pray. And uh, then he tells us how to pray in secret. And now he's telling us uh, how we might pray, what words to use. Now we're coming to a portion of scripture that most of us know and uh, as the Lord's Prayer. Uh, really, that's not uh, named uh, as good as it could be. We know it is the Lord's Prayer, but it's the model prayer. The Lord's Prayer is in John chapter 17, where he prays for his disciples. He prays for the world. He, he prays for all of us, uh, past, present, and future. And he prays for the glory uh, that he had to be restored and that his relationship with the Father uh, be uh, solidified, well, not solidified, but it would be recognized, if you will, by all that are hearing him pray. But this is the model prayer. And sometimes we repeat it out of rote memory as if praying the words exactly as they've been printed in our Bibles and given to us has some kind of magical influence on God. It's not that. It's the manner of praying. And that's what he says in verse uh, nine. He says, after this manner, therefore pray. Let this be a model or uh, let this be a pattern for you to pray. So after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts or our trespasses as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever amen and i want us to just take a little time on this model prayer and let's learn something from this model prayer in order to help our prayer life remember what dr mckeever said pray anyway okay and this will help us to pray anyway to have a little more education about the that should lead to the inspiration that can lead to the transformation of our prayer life. So he says, listen, when you pray, pray after this manner and include adoration uh, in your prayer for God. Our Father 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That word hallow means to give honor to, give high regard to, give respect to his name. And the name of the Father, uh, Yahweh, it, God, is most holy. And you know, one of the Ten Commandments says, don't use the Lord thy God's name in vain. It's, ho uh, it's hollow, and it's holy, and it's separate from any other name. Would you use your mama or your daddy's name as a cuss word or in a derogatory way? Of course you wouldn't. I hope you wouldn't. And therefore, don't use our heavenly father's name in a derogatory or shameful way for as one of his children his name is hollow and holy and it is to be regarded and respected with all the good regard and respect that we have our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name and we adore him for who he is he's holy set apart from all of us God is the one and only God revealed to us through the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then there's that pattern of subjugation that is hallowed be thy name. That is our adoration. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And what we're saying here is, Lord, I'm submitting myself to you. Now, if you're not willing to submit yourself to the Lord in prayer then you're wasting really any all your time in prayer because he's not going to finance your wayward way of living he's not going to uh, keep you up in not doing his will we belong to him remember we just called him our father we are his children and i was raised to obey my parents amen of course that's what we're to do we are to be in obedience to our heavenly father as his heavenly children and so thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven and that's the one wonderful thing that we can take comfort and courage in that god's will though it may not be being fulfilled here on earth it's being fulfilled in heaven and eventually it will be fulfilled here on this earth and it is to be fulfilled in the hearts and the lives of his children as we pray after this manner lord let thy will be done in me in this earth as it is in heaven and so in order to know what god's will is we get to we have to hear from him and that's where this bible study comes into play in all bible study thy word is truth sanctifies by thy truth all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And now we move on to the next word, verse. It's a prayer of petition in verse 11. Look at it. It says, Give us this day our daily bread. Isn't that wonderful to know that God is our provider? He protects us. He provides for us. He's always present with us. And to have a relationship with God is to have a relationship with the bread of life, the bread maker. He gives us our daily bread. Now, it's important for you to note, if you haven't ever noted it before, he says daily bread. Uh, you don't have to pray for tomorrow, just pray for today. Tomorrow may never come. Uh, tomorrow has its issues, as the scripture tells us. But guess what? God's already there. And he's the, same day, he's the same God tomorrow as he is today and as he was yesterday. And so we can always count on God to fulfill our needs. And think of the children while they were in the wilderness. God provided them manna each day except on Friday. He gave them a double portion for not only Friday but for Saturday because they were not to work or to gather on the Sabbath day and they always had enough and God said if you gather too much it's going to spoil just ask him to pray or ask him to provide for what you need today and that's not just uh, physical sustenance it's spiritual sustenance too anything that you need you ask God to give it to you on a daily basis and that keeps us coming to him daily 
And that keeps reminding of us that God is faithful each and every day. Now, I'm getting on up there in years. I've been on this earth and next birthday, be celebrating 65 years. And look at me. You can, <laughs> God's provided for me physically, hasn't he? Amen. He's given, him, he's given me more than what I deserve. And he's taken care of me this long. Now, wouldn't it be kind of uh, uh, really uh, not too smart of me to think that if God, who's taking care of me all these years, can't care for me tomorrow? Well, certainly it would be. It would be a great uh, act of unbelief and, and ignorance and just pure stupidity. Let's just go ahead and call it what it is to think that God who's provided for me all these years can't provide for me tomorrow. Well, he can, and God can provide for you too. He's taken care of you this long, hasn't he? Go ahead and say amen. He has, and he's given all of us more than what we deserve. Remember that. So, pray after this manner. Adore the Lord. Hallowed be thy name. Submit yourself to his will. Thy will be done in me in earth as it is in heaven. And then you petition him for your needs. Oh, Lord, give me this day my daily bread. And then don't forget, he's the great counsel, counselor, counsel outer is what I'm trying to say. The one who counsels out our sin. He eliminates our sin. Look again at uh, verse 12. And forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And certainly through the Lord Jesus Christ, God has canceled out our debts. The cancellation of our sin is one of the greatest blessings in this world and what's in which we experience as Christians to know that our sin has been forgiven. And you know, that's why we can call him our Heavenly Father. We now have that vertical relationship with God the Father because our sins have been canceled out. And before Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, and before you asked him to forgive you, uh, depending on that shed blood that was poured out on the cross as a payment for the penalty of your sin, we couldn't approach God. There was a, there was a blockage there. God was up here and we're down here and our sin kept us from having a relationship with God. But God did away with that sin. When he laid that sin on the Lord Jesus Christ and, he, and he, the Lord bore our sins and he was buried and raised again, the third day. Now we have a relationship with the Father. But notice in the verse it says, forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. If we have a new relationship with the Father and a vertical relationship with the Father, then we're going to have a new relationship on the horizontal plane with our brothers and sisters in Christ. How can we say, I won't forgive you when God has forgiven us. You know, the greatest sin ever committed and the greatest debt that was ever owed is our sin against the Lord Jesus Christ. We owe him a great debt. And he paid a debt that he didn't know and for uh, uh, paid a price that he didn't owe for a debt we couldn't pay. And now that we have a relationship vertically, we ought to have a new perspective horizontally with our brothers and sisters in Christ. God forgave us. Now we need to forgive one another because Christ is living in us and the forgiveness of Christ should be living through us. And one of the ways to tell that somebody's been saved, they don't hold it against people who've offended them and who come to them and ask them for forgiveness because we have experienced the forgiveness of the Heavenly Father. Look what he says about that more in verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Those are uh, ominous words, but they need not be. If you've experienced the forgiveness of the Lord, then you know what it means to be forgiven and you also know what it means to offer now forgiveness. You can do that. And when we pray, a lot of times it comes up in our minds, the old devil likes to bring it up, and just our old sin-sick selves 
uh, want to hang on to it, what somebody's done against us. This will help you if you'll remember what you've done against God. That is, you nailed him to the cross. Your sin and my sin nailed him to the cross. We deserve to die and go to hell, but Jesus forgave us. And Then how can we hold anything else against anyone or anything against anyone after God has forgiven us for all that we've done? Nobody has sinned against us. Nobody has sinned against me. Nobody has done me wrong as much as I sinned against the Lord Jesus and have done him wrong, yet he forgave me. Whew. Praise the Lord. Amen. He forgave me. Now, we must quickly bring this to an end here, all right? But it's a glorious end. It's just the beginning. It's the front end, all right? Let's look again. Now, this the pattern of adoration, subjugation, cancellation, and uh, the direction and now of pet or petitioning the Lord, and now the direction that we ask the God to send us in when we pray to him and his protection in doing that. Look at it. In verse 13, and Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Lead us not into temptation. Now, if you're going to pray, Lord, lead me, then you got to pick up your feet and follow. Some of us say, Lord, lead me, and we don't pick up our feet because we don't like the way in which he's leading us. Now, the psalmist said in the 23rd Psalm, he leads me in the way of righteousness. And that's the way he's going to lead us. He's going to lead us in what's right. Wherewith all shall a man, young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to the word of God. And when you follow him, you're going to follow him the ways of righteousness. He's not going to lead you wrong. And so the best way to stay out of temptation is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can't go shopping, window shopping, in the devil's storefront, if you know what I'm talking about. You've got to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on him. And then lastly, for thine is the power, the glory, and the kingdom forever. Amen. That's just summing up in praise and adoration. And so when we pray, let's remember that. Let's pray. Not if we pray, remember? Jesus said, and when you pray, let's remember the pattern of prayer. May I pray for you using that pattern of prayer. Would you join me, please, at this time? Oh, Father, you are in heaven, and you are on your throne, and you rule, Lord, sovereignly, and you rule righteously, Lord. And because of that, and because of who you are and what you do, your name is to be hallowed. It is to be honored. It is to be revered. Hallowed be thy name. And, Father, we pray today that as your children... Having the right to call you Father, we also have the responsibility to live out your will in our lives in this earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, as we pray and as we ask you to forgive us of our sins, we pray, Lord, that you would help us in remembering what Jesus has done for us to be forgiving to others, to be gracious to them, to be long-suffering, to love them even when they're unlovable, just like Jesus loved us while we were yet sinners. And thank you, Father, for being the one who gives us everything that we need. You especially gave us what we needed through the Lord Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sin. And if you were able and you were willing to give us what we needed the most and offer your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest gift that you could give and the greatest gift that we could receive, how much more are you able and willing to give us all these other things that we need for our earthly sustenance, Lord, for our earthly survival? And you will, Lord. You give us all things. And Father, we pray that you would help us to stay clear of temptation. And Lord, keep us from the evil one as we follow in thy footprints, knowing, Lord, that you give us direction through your word. For again, it is profitable for doctrine and reproof and correction for instruction and in righteousness. And Lord, we thank you for yours is the power. You have all authority. Yours is the kingdom and it is eternal forever and ever. And so when we come to you, Lord, whether we pray in public and help us to be sincere, not to pray to be heard and seen of men, Lord, but when we are called on maybe by the preacher in the congregation to stand up and lead in prayer, 
Help us to remember that we're praying unto you. And when we pray for others, we're praying intercedingly, Lord. We're not trying to preach down at anybody in our prayers. We're not trying to puff up ourselves and be uh, admired for our prayers. We're just praying for you, to you, Lord. But we know that you hear our prayers the first time we pray. And we don't have to be repetitious. And therefore, Father, help us to pray sincerely in public. Help us to pray faithfully in private. And knowing, Lord, that we can trust you, we can uh, have the confidence that you hear us in secret and that you re will reward us openly. Father, for those that are listening in to this message, I pray, Lord, that you would renew and revive and re-energize their prayer life as well as mine. Help us, Lord, to pray. Let us pray and let us pray anyway. In Jesus' name we do pray. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen.